Vita for your music and thank you Adelaide for that pretty song. I, we appreciate that very much. Turn with me this morning to James and chapter 5 in the book of James, the epistle James and chapter chapter 5. Always remember James is a pastor. He's a pastor at Jerusalem. James writes like a pastor because he thinks like a pastor and whenever he comes down to the end uh, I think it's about 108 verses or something like that five chapters in the epistle James James comes down and he shares some things with us I think something that we need very much today and I'm going to begin reading in verse 7 uh, in in this here now watch very carefully be patient Therefore, brethren, notice, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious uh, fruit of the earth and, and have long patience, for it is until he received the early and the latter rain. All right, a, a farmer uh, probably has more patience than anybody. Uh, he plants his crop. He's got everything ready. Now he has to rely upon the Lord. The Lord will send the sunshine. The farmer can't. The Lord will send the rain. The farmer can't. So he waits. You'll notice in two, two times in verse 7, James is used, going to use the word patient. Be patient. In verse seven, uh, 8, he said, Be ye also patient. Establish your heart. In other words, strengthen your heart uh, for the coming of the Lord draweth, draweth near. And we know that every day that we live is one day uh, closer to the coming of our Lord. And he said, Gird not one against another, or grudge not one against another, brother, lest you be con condemned. He said, Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my, take my brother the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. James uses patience a lot uh, in those verses, but my text is verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. How true that is. Ye have heard the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, for, for the Lord is very pitiful, in other words, compassionate and tender mercy in this here. In verse, seven, or verse 11, James said, You have heard of the patience of Job. I look at this and I think, yes, I've heard it. I've read it many times. But you know, James, I need to hear it again. I need to be reminded. I need to be refreshed in 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 life uh, in in the things of life in this here. I need to go back and I need to think the patience that Job had, how Job conducted his life in this here. You will notice there's two things in verse 11 that James talks about in this here. The patience of Job. We're going to talk about that. In a little bit here and then the second one is the end of the Lord uh, you've seen the end of the Lord well that means the consummation of his purpose in this here you won't have to turn there but in Genesis in chapter 1 uh, we find uh, and in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth in verse 3 he created the light and then he said it is good it is good then you go down a little bit, you'll see the sea and so on like this. He created that and he said, it is good. All right, that's a purpose. And if God doesn't have to redo, all right? Uh, when you and I look at something that God has made, then that's it. Uh, and he had a purpose in this here. So James is going to give us some good advice. I'm weak, I'm feeble. I need good advice and I need to be reminded every once in a while about uh, that good advice in this here. 
we seen back there a while ago about the patience of Job. And let's go to the book of Job and chapter 1 for just a moment and end this here. I don't know that I'll go back to James. <coughs> I might, but I'm not, I'm not sure that I'll go back to him in this year because I need some good sound advice. I don't know where I could get uh, better advice than from God, than from his word uh, in, in this year. And I hope and pray this morning that this advice that he's going to give us will be a blessing. It will be a help to each and every one of us. Remember, the key is patience. The key to this is patience. And James is talking about, about this thing here. And you'll notice, be patient, the coming of the Lord. We know he's coming. There's no doubt but what he's coming, but we have to be patient. He tells us in Matthew and what? In chapter 24, I think it is. He said, man does not know. Angels do not know. Only God knows when the Son of Man is coming back. Only God knows this. So what am I to do? I'm to be patient. I'm to be, and I'm to be patient, and I'm to work uh, in, in this thing here. James was a patriarch. Or, uh, Job was a patriarch. Job was tried like nobody else has ever been tried. In chapter 1 of the book of Job, notice in verse 3, there were born unto him seven sons, three daughters, ten children. What a family. Large family. Ten children. Uh, sometimes in visiting, I'll tell people, well, there was eight of us in the family, and they'll say, wow. But uh, probably 40-some-odd years ago, I was visiting in a home, and we were, we, we were talking, and I said something about uh, that there was eight of us kids in the family, and they just sat there. And after a bit, Jim said, well, they was 15 in ours. And in a little bit, his Diane said, there was 20 in ours. And I thought, well, I don't need to tell people there's eight of us anymore uh, in, in this here. But he's got 10 children. He and his wife have got 10 children. The next verse you're going to notice, his subject was also 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 sea ashes, she ashes, and a very great household, so that he, this man was the greatest of all of the men of the East. He's got 10 kids. He's got much wealth uh, in, in this here. And whenever you probably turn or not very far from that, you're going to find whenever the tragic begins to strike, you're going to find that they're going to lose all 10 of the children. Not one, not two, but 10 of the children. Now we're beginning to see whenever James is talking to the, to the congregation, writing to the congregation, he said, you remember, you remember Job? You remember the patience of Job? All right. Now, he loses the family. He's going to lose all of his wealth uh, in, in this here. And then whenever you turn to chapter 2 and verse 4 down to 8 of chapter 2, you're going to find that he gets sick. And you're going to find this at, in this sickness that he's going to have He's going to have boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Now we're beginning to see, remember Job? Remember the patience of Job? Yeah. Not only that, but you're going to find in verse 9 of chapter 2. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Now, isn't that something? Lose 10 children, lose all of your wealth, get sick from the, and, and sick in this here, and he sits, he sits on a dunghill 
uh, in this here in chapter 2. And then his wife is going to say, in our language, she's going to say, curse God and commit suicide. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? All right, before you close chapter 2, you're going to find three so-called friends are going to come. And they're going to come and you're going to notice that they're going to sit there for a while and not say a word. Not say a word. And then they're beginning. Uh, and when you study the book of Job, always remember there may be one chapter. In fact, in chapter 3, Job is going to talk. Okay? Then in chapter 4, one of the friends is going to talk. And that's a way that it operates in the book of Job uh, in this here. And you're going to find that that these friends are going to, they've got the answers, but they don't have. But they think they have. They think that Job is a problem, but Job is not the problem uh, in this here. And so I look at this and I think, okay, James, I, I, I need to be reminded of this. I need to because... We're going through some things today that are very difficult. We're going through times today that we've never went. We've never went down this pike uh, in our lives today uh, in this here. This is not mine. This is someone that I picked up in this here. In verse 4 down to 8 of chapter 2, it talks about his sickness and so on like this here. And this guy said, every part of his body hurt. Every nerve was the road in which the armies of pain went down in this here. The trials of Job were real. They were real. Not only does James recall it and remind us of it, but we can go over and we can read the 42 chapters of the book of Job and see this here, and then we'll find other people talking about this here. So he was a real man. He, he lived in a very difficult time in this. And as I said to you, he lost 10 children, not one, but he lost. He didn't lose part of his wealth. He lost all of his wealth in this here. He became sick in this here. Now, in our thinking today, if we would look and let's say, Let's say sometimes uh, we're, we're going through a difficult time. And uh, we look at this here and, and we'll think, well, I know the reason why I'm going through this difficult time in my life is something that I've done. Uh, I, I, I didn't do this right or I went against what God said or whatever. And so now I know why that I'm going through this. Did you ever, did you ever see what the Bible said about Job? Well, look at chapter one and look at verse two or verse one. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job and the man was perfect. That doesn't mean he was sinless. The word perfect there means he was matured, upright. In other words, he was straight dealing with people in this here. One that feared God. In other words, he respected, he honored God in this here, and he chose evil in, in this here. In other words, he was a man that stayed away from bad things. He, he lived a good, clean, moral life in this here. Then you go over to chapter 2. And then you're going to find in verse 3, pretty much the same thing in this here. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant? Job, there is none like him in the earth. None like him. Nobody like him in this here. Perfect, upright man that feareth God and achieveth evil. Still he holdeth uh, fast his integrity. Think about that. No wonder James is up and James says, before I close my epistle, I want to talk to you about and I want to call your attention to a guy by the name of Job in this year. All of this, 
losing the family, losing the wealth, his sickness in this here, he up and notice here, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And I look at this and I think, isn't that something? Isn't that something? Now, no wonder James says, I want you to think about Job in, in this here. And so I look at this and I think about bringing it to 2,000. And I look at this and I think, why are people, why are we going through this virus? There's not a one of us asked for this. There's not a one of us that understand it. In all probability, this virus has left China and not only has it went to China, not only has it went to Japan, not only has it went to, to the United States of America, it is all over the world. Who ever heard of such a thing as this? You don't see it, but there it is in this here. And so people stop and they'll think, why? What have I done? What has America done? What has happened to this world that we've seen something like this? Let me take you to a place. If you haven't been there, in all probability, you will go there. And let's go to the 73rd chapter of the book of Psalms. The 73rd chapter of the book of Psalms. I'll come back to Job maybe here in a moment uh, in this here. This is not written by David. This is written by Asaph. You go back and you'll see who Asaph was. In verse 1, he said, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. In other words, they are living good, they are thinking good, they are acting good in this year. But then he says, But as for me, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well now nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. How many, how many that are watching me this morning, how many have been down that road? You've looked out and you've watched the wicked and you've seen them prosper. And you think, why? Here I am struggling. Here I am going through trying times. And I look at these people and I, I see them doing wickedness and they're prospering. Now watch him. He's not done. He said, for there is no ban in their debt, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as others, men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore thou, uh, therefore the pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment in this here. And then you're going to see what he goes on and says in this here. To save time, we'll not look at all, all of it in this here. But here he is. And I always think uh, when I look at this, and trust me, uh, there's been a time or two that I have, that I have uh, looked at this. And I kind of stand on the sideline and I look and I think, uh, they're not doing right. They're doing wrong. They're acting wrong. They're thinking wrong. And yet, it seems like they're prospering. They're doing good. Lord, do we not have an answer? Do we not, do we not have a solution for this? And the Lord could say, oh, yes, there is. And there was a solution for ASAP. And look at verse 16 and 17. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, he said. 17 is the key until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I then understood I the there in in this here. The closer that a person gets to God, is, the, is the, the best that they're going to be able to see and understand some of the problems in life here. The closeness to God 
we're going to be able to see and understand some of these things in this. You'll notice where the, where the psalmist went. He went into the house of God. You see that? And when he got into the house of God, then he began to understand. He began to see some things. Did it ever occur to you why God established the local church? Did you ever think about it? In, Acts, er, in Matthew chapter 16, he said, Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Up on this rock, not upon Peter, but upon this rock, I will build my church in this here. And I think about the greatest place, the greatest building in your county, in your commonwealth, is the church that is teaching the word of God. There is no doubt whatsoever about it. Not a church that entertains people. Not a church that's turned it into a, uh, to an entertainment place. But it's a church that preaches and teaches the word of God. Is the greatest place there is in this. You know how great it is? In Acts in chapter 20, Luke writes in there. And he said that Christ shed his blood for the church. He purchased a church with his blood uh, in, in this here. And I look at this. Now, notice with me as I, as I go on in, in Psalms in chapter 73. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Notice this. You set them into slippery places that cast us them down into destruction in this here. And then you're going to notice, and again to save time, in verse 23, uh, 22, so foolish was I, he said, and ignorant. I was as, as a beast before thee. And that's right. When we stand and we look and we ponder upon these things, and then we don't understand until we get into the house of God. And we get in there, there's nothing like. And somebody said to me the other day, when are we going to have church again? I don't know, but I sure hope it's soon in this here. I miss being with the people. I miss listening to the people saying, I, be, I miss the, listening to the teaching of the word of God in this here. And I look and I think, oh, how foolish I was to think about the envious of these people here. Notice something else in this here. In verse 24, thou shalt guide me. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Isn't that something? Sure he will. Sure he will. You remember? In John in chapter 14 and John in chapter 16, Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going to go away. He In, in the latter part of 13, he tells them, he said, I, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. And that bothers the disciples. You mean to tell me that you're going to leave us in this here? But then he said, wait a minute. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to, I'm going to, Father's going to send you the Holy Spirit. The Comforter is going to come. And, and in chapter 16, he said the Comforter or the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into all truth. Isn't that wonderful to think about? How did I know that? I know that by the Word of God. I know that by being taught in the church uh, in, in these things like this here. We're all going to suffer. We're going to have moments in our life that we doubt. We're, we're going to become kind of like Thomas sometimes in this here. But we're going to be strengthened by going into the house of God, listening to the word of God, or reading the word of God in this here. Look at 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. See that? With thy counsel. After you receive me to glory in this here. Look at 26. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever in this. All of us are going to suffer. We're not, we don't go to the doctor and get a shot of uh, being immune to these things. We're going to suffer. Think about our Lord. Think about our Savior hanging up on the cross, shedding that precious blood for us. 
and he cries out from Calvary, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? We're going to suffer. We're going to have difficult times in, in this here. And I look at, I look at the Job and I think, Job, you suffered. You went through these things here. And Job, Job was an upright man. Job didn't do anything wrong that you and I could find uh, in, in this thing here. And so uh, we look at him and we'll say, here's a man that didn't do any wrong. He stayed away from trouble. He done all these things. And yet Job suffered. Job suffered in, in this year. The age of question for now is why this virus? Why has this virus come all over the world? Why? Why is it taken so many lives? I was sharing with Judy last night. Uh, I was reading in 1300, there was a, a plague that came. And uh, uh, I forget how many million people. And you know how it started? It started by a boat that come into a dock. And on that boat, it had a multitude of six sailors, six sa sailors in this boat here. And they let some of them come in. Many of them died on the boat and so on uh, like this here. This virus maybe has come from from uh, China, in all probability it has in this. We got some politicians saying, let's, in the state of Missouri, they have filed suit uh, against uh, uh, China because of this thing here. I look at this and I say, why? Well, there's people that's a lot smarter than I maybe have got it figured out. But I'm wondering, God doesn't sin or God doesn't allow things like this to come just to be not having anything else to do. You remember in Genesis in chapter 6, you remember God said that he up and he saw the wickedness of man and his imagination was continually evil. And then God said to Noah, Noah, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, yeah. I want you to take your family and I want you to begin to build an ark. Now think about this. Noah had never seen an ark before. It had never rained before. And he wants me to build an ark and God gives him the way, gives him the introduction to it, how to build it, all of this here. And then as he works on it for 120 years, then one day God is going to say, Noah, come in. And Noah is going to step in that ark with his family. And Noah's not going to see a motor. He's not going to see oars. He's not going to see a sail. He's going. He's not going to have any idea how thing that how this thing is going to work. But he goes in. He goes in. I don't know how this thing is going to play out, but I know this. I know God is going to help us if we will let Him help us. If we we want to stand on the outside and criticize people in this here, and we need to get on the inside. And listen to God. What does God tell us to do in this time? Turn with me to Second Chronicles. Turn with me to Second Chronicles in chapter seven. Second Chronicles in chapter seven. Listen, listen to what the Lord says in this here. If my people, in verse fourteen, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Stop for a moment. Stop for a moment. Humble themselves. We're a proud people. We're a proud people. We're too proud, I think, sometimes in this here. Think about what God has done for us. Think about the things that he's, that he's done. We're, 
humble themselves. Moses was the most humble man there was. I think about Moses. Uh, the Lord saying to Moses and Aaron, I want you to go see Pharaoh. All right. And I want you to tell Pharaoh, you see this in Exodus chapter 5. I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh comes back and he said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? If we're not careful, we're a people like it today. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Humble himself in, in this year. How many Christian people are they today that are laying out from church, from the church. They haven't been to church in no telling how long in this year. Uh, why? Why are they? Because they think, I don't need God. All right, now watch what he says. Humble themselves, pray. Pray. Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I know, hear from heaven and will forgive them and will heal uh, their land. Will I humble? Will I pray? Will I seek his face in, in this year? God doesn't ask us to do uh, something that he knows we're not capable of doing. All of us can humble. All of us can, can pray in this sometime. People say, I don't know how to pray. Ask him. Ask him to help us. Ask him to teach us how to pray and he'll do this here. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter tells us, he said to up and cast thy cares upon him for he careth for us in this here. We're to come to him. We're to humble ourselves in this here. Sometimes we get to thinking uh, uh, and we begin to forget who is the sovereign of this world? Who's the sovereign one of history? Who's the sovereign one of the church? It's God. It's not Satan. It's not Satan in this year. God knows where we're at. God knows our predicament. And God wants to help us. If he helped Job, why won't he help us? Why won't he? You know why, you know why that he helped Job? is because Job went through those 40 some odd chapters in this year. Job up and he submitted to the Lord in this year. He heard the criticism. Absolutely, he heard the criticism. He heard what his wife had to say. Yes, he heard that. But he, st he remained his integrity in this. I want to show you something. God, God allows things to happen. But God uh, also can put a stop to these things. Going back to Job for just a moment in chapter 2. And I want you to notice with me uh, in, in this here from 4 down to 6 in this here. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man have will he, will he give for his life. All right? Now we don't need to be uh, told about that. We can kind of understand that there. But put forth thy hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee uh, to thy face. All right? In other words, Job is, or the Satan is saying to him in this here, uh, you know, he's, he gets sick. He's lost his 10 kids. He's lost all his wealth. He gets sick. He's going to curse you. He's going to curse God in this here. But now watch God. He's the sovereign one. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand but save his life. You can't take his life. You can't. You may, you, uh, you may have him to get sick. You may this, you may that, but you can't take his life. That's a sovereign God that we have today in, in this here. God is almighty. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient in these things here, in this here. And I looked and I think about Job retained his integrity. Gosh, I love that. I'll I tell you that. Now, 
if we'll do what God says. And it's not always easy to do what God says. My land, it's not, it's not easy to do what God says sometimes. But deep down, we know it's right. We know it's right in this here. Well, the age-old question, and you'll find the answer in the, in the Bible naturally. What about the latter part of Job's life? Let's go to chapter 42. Chapter 42 of the uh, of the book of Job and uh, listen to uh, uh, 42 and listen to this here as we begin in verse 10 and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends you see that when you study those 30 some odd chapters of how those friends are going to come and the, how they're going to criticize Job and all of this like this here Job is going to pray for him. Is it easy to pray for the enemy? No. But it's right. But it's right. People criticize you. Yes, they cr people criticize you because you do right. But look at here. And when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brothers and all his sisters and all they had been of his acquaintance before. And look at uh, verse 12. So the Lord blessed the father, the latter end of Job, more than the beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 8,000 yoke of oxen, 8,000 sea ashes. That takes you back to chapter 1. And he also... And he had also seven sons and three daughters in this year. Whenever James back there a while ago, he said, you remember the end of the Lord? I need to go back there for, he said here, and have seen the end of the Lord. The things that God had accomplished in this year. You remember you remember this great man of God by the name of Abraham that made some mistakes in his life? But you remember there came a time in Genesis in chapter 22 whenever God said to him, Abraham, yes, sir. I want, to take, I want you to take Isaac, your only begotten son, and go to Mount Moriah. We read that no telling how many times. And we've walked along with Abraham and Isaac and we've listened to Isaac say, say to his daddy, Abraham, Daddy, I see the fire, I see the wood. But Daddy, where's the sacrifice at? And Abraham said, Son, God will provide. God will provide. I think about in Daniel in chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think about them, and I think about how they, they fired that furnace up so hot at the men that cast them in burned up. And I think these men stayed true to the word of God, and they came out, and they didn't have any smell on their clothes. All of us have read the story of John Bunyan, great preacher. Whether the story is true or not, and I think that it is, they arrested John because he was preaching on the sidewalks and the judge was a friend of John Bunyan. And the judge said to him, John, if you'll stop preaching, I'll not put you in prison. You know what? John said, God called me to preach. I've got to preach. I've got to preach. He spent 12 years in the Bedfast prison. You know what came out of that? The book called Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know what's going to come out of this. I don't know. 
I'm not smart enough to figure it out yet. But I know this. I know if we'll stay true to God, we'll come out of this thing here and we'll be all right in this here. Listen, God loves us. I know he loves us because he gave his only begotten son to die upon the cross. And that son came and that son died upon the cross that you and I might have eternal life in this here. I don't know tomorrow. I don't know an hour from now. But God knows because God holds his saying in his hand in this. Will you trust Christ as your Savior? Will you, will you do what God tells you to do in this here? Remember, God loves us. God cares for us. And going back to the, uh, the verse in 2 Chronicles in this here, he's not asking us to do something that we can't do. He's not asking us to do that. But he's asking us to do something that we can Will you receive Jesus as your Savior? Let's have time of prayer. Lord, I pray that we've done you justice in the lesson today. I don't understand these things, Lord, but I know you know everything. Nothing takes you by surprise. Thank you for that. Help us, Lord. May we be smart enough to let you guide us, to let you take us down the road. We know that you'll never take us the wrong route. It's always the right route. Bless these people. Help these people, Lord. Forgive us of where we failed you. For I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm.